Amen. God's word is certainly precious. Amen. It is magnificent in the eyes of those that adore him. Praise God. And we have been, as one writer said, given richly all things to enjoy. And the privilege is all ours. Amen. These days in which we live in, saints, certainly eh, they are, uh, at times they're trying, but yet it should cause all of us to, um, as we um, go, go forth in these days, it ought to cause all of us to, uh, to make sure that we are making, as one writer said, our calling and election sure, because the days of this dispensation, the church dispensation, certainly is drawing to a close, but yet God is still calling people out of darkness into this wonderful and glorious, marvelous light in which we have today. And I'm just glad that I'm a part of what God is doing in the earth. As I've said before and I'll say again, the most important thing that God is doing in the earth is in the church. God is displaying his true purpose um, in the earth through the church today and helping all, all of his people to understand his ways and his days that he uh, wants to reveal to all of us. And we've been studying, we started this Bible study last week. We've been studying certainly a precious subject in your Bible, the seven feast of Jehovah, which saints is a study of time, what God planned to do in a period of 50,000 years, which is time. And so... Um, we had begin to deal with the fact that God hid his eternal um, plan um, in the seven feasts, what he planned to do uh, in the seven feasts, he gave them to Israel, and they acted out God's plan uh, for approximately 1,500 years under the law. Moses, we spoke about last week that God gave Moses God's plan when he went up into the mount on the back side of, as it were, um, in the mountain, excuse me, and hid him away in the cleft of the rock, covered him there with his hand, and let all of his goodness pass before him. Now, I want to make the point as we go into this, we have to understand that whatever God wants to do in the church, of any significant saints, he always gives us a, an example. He gives us a type, a likeness, so that we could... Uh, understand and know what his plan is. God never does anything without having uh, a plan, a form, a fashion, a type, a shadow that we can look to and understand uh, in example form what he requires. And the reason why I'm teaching this and I'm going to take, uh, we're going to take some time on this particular subject is because it's important for we who are born again of water and spirit to understand what God's plan is. And so what God did is that he took Israel and he simply gave them these seven feasts, which are his days, and we'll get into it tonight. Um, and I'm going to explain to you how we come up with uh, uh, the terminology of generations in terms of these days. It's in your Bible. But in any case, God wanted to make sure that, I'm going to take this shirt off if you don't, if you, um, don't I mean this jacket, excuse me. I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, praise the Lord, but I, I want to be comfortable. Can the church say amen? So in any case, um, the point is that God did this to, to show um, what he planned to do for the church. We, we're going to examine this from three specific areas. The first thing is creation. What did God do in creation? The second thing will be, of course, the typology that you see in the Old Testament the example that he gave us, and then the fulfillment in the New Testament. Because each one of these days, there is a type um, or anti-type that we see in the New Testament church. Can the church say amen? And so this is how God did it because he wanted to make sure that the church would understand what was God's eternal purpose, what was God's eternal plan. And at the end of this Bible study, you will find that God's eternal purpose is that he would have a family. He would have his bride in heaven. 
He will have his children on earth, praise the Lord, and he will be able to take his rest. Can the church say amen? So I want to go to, as a place to start tonight, let's go into 1 Corinthians uh, chapters, number, um, chapters number 10 tonight. Um, and then we're going to look at the example to establish the fact that he gave us an example. We may reiterate a few things before we get into the specific days. And just to remind you tonight, what was God's first day? If you can bring chart number one up. If you can bring chart number one up. Praise the Lord. Passover. This was the first day. This is what the, now remember, this is not our day. This is God's day. He hid what he did on the first day of creation in a feast called Passover. His second day was what? Unleavened bread. His third day was what? First fruits. Fourth day, Pentecost. Fifth day, trumpets. Sixth day, atonement. Seventh day, tabernacles. And all of these days coincide with what, get, with what, di, what God did on each day of creation, the example that he gave Israel, and what he's going to do in the New Testament church today. So let's go to, I said 1 Corinthians, right? 1 Corinthians chapters number 10. Let's look at this here and we'll get into this Bible study. Can the church say amen? These days are called generations. Praise the Lord. A generation is simply a period of time. And each generation is a period of 7,000 years, making up 49,000 years. In the 50th year, is what is called jubilee, eternity. And there's a scripture that we'll read as we get further along. Probably, it'll probably be close to the end of the Bible study. But in any case, it deals with eternity. But let's look at this, 1 Corinthians chapters number 10, and I think, yes, let's go to verse number 11. Praise the Lord. What did it say here? Now all, th all things happen unto them. The them is Israel. For examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. Now let's go back here. All things happen unto them for examples or examples. Mm -hmm. And they are written for our admonition. The R here is the church, the New Testament church. Now we can go back here and we can read in the uh, first verse of this chapter and you will see what he's referring to. For the, let's go back to verse number 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you have uh, ye to be ig uh, ignorant how that your fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now what he's referring to is the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, two chapters before they received the Passover. They were baptized uh, under the cloud. The cloud typifies saints, the, uh, the presence of God with the people. Or it typified in that, in this sense, it typified the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And as they went through the Red Sea, that typified our water baptism in Jesus' name. Now he points to the fact that in the 11th verse, all of those things were done for what? In examples. And the point I wanted to uh, make by reading this verse was to show us that everything that happened to the children of Israel happened simply for an example to us. God took the time out to give examples in the Old Testament for the children of God today. He didn't do it for them. He did it for us. As I made the point last Bible study that all of the things that he did, that they did for 1,500 years under the law, pertaining to the acting out of God's days, what he did in creation, and what he was going to do in the church, he did it, saints, not for them, but for us. Can the church say amen? He did it so that we would know his days. Praise the Lord. He wanted us to understand. And we read the scripture, I think it was in the 24th chapter of Job, verses number one. Seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, my, uh, as it were, why my people don't know my days. Now, we are his people. The Bible said we are the sheep of his pastor. We belong to him. 
So I simply wanted to make the point by reading this text to show us that the seven feasts of Jehovah was not for Israel. It was for us. It was for us to understand what God did in creation and how he was going to fulfill these seven feasts, these seven days and or generations in the New Testament church. Now I'm going to have to take some time to, to build this so we can understand before we get into each day. So these were simply God's days given unto the children of Israel to act out as puppets or actors on the stage. They didn't know the script. They were simply doing what Moses gave them to do. Can the church say amen? And I, I wanted to show you that what he referred to particularly in this, in this chapter is the typology of water and spirit baptism that they had that they went through to show us that also we have to go through in our day. Can the church say man? But he didn't do it for them, he did it for us. Praise the Lord, because he wanted us to understand his days. All right, now let's go, I told you that God has generations. Let's go to Genesis, praise the Lord, chapters number two and verses number one through four. Generations. These are the generations of the Lord, your Bible said. These seven generations. The first 34 verses of your Bible is what God planned to do in a period of seven days, 7,000 years long. Praise the Lord. And they're called generations as we see in the text, in the scriptures. Praise the Lord. And all right, what did it say here? Thus the heavens and the earth was finished, were finished, and all the host of heaven. Now the host of heaven here is the church. Now, as, it, as we read right now, it is not finished. God is still working upon his church. We are in the sixth day. But remember, God speaks those things that be not as though they are. So as far as God is concerned, the work was done before it was finished. So what you're reading here, saints, is what God plans to do. When you read in the book of Genesis, chapters number one, verses number one through 31, and verses number one through four, what you're reading is God's plan. Now, of course, some of those days have been accomplished. Day one through five is finished. We are yet in the sixth day. Isn't that right? I made the statement last week that the earth is approximately 41,000 years old. It is not 50 billion, trillion, whatever they come up with. There is no facts behind any of that. Can the church say amen? And any laws that man knows, he knows because God gave it to him. And we're going to get into the fact that the laws of science, God gave them. Can the church say amen? So... He says, thus the heavens and the, and the earth were finished. Now, this is in his mind because God, as far as God is concerned, this is done, correct? And the host of heaven. Now, remember this. The host of heaven is the church. God is going to have a church. The host of heaven. What is the church is going to consist of? His bride and the virgin's companions, the host of heaven. Now, at, now at the end of, not the end of the sixth day, he will begin to establish his children here on earth. We talked about that, I think it was last Bible study on a Friday. When he, when he begins to plant the heavens in the sixth day when he takes his rest. How is he going to plant it? He's going to populate the earth. And I, I'm getting ahead of myself so I don't want to get too far because I'll spoil the surprise. Can the church say amen? All right. All right, and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. Now, which he had created to make, because what God does is that what he thinks, praise the Lord, is called creation. What he speaks is what we call making. Everything that starts in, the, in um, how can I say it, everything that is made first starts in the mind of the thinker. Because God is the thinker. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. In the beginning was the thinker. The word was in the mind of the thinker. The word was the thinker. Praise the Lord. He thought the thought. 
and then what he thought he began to cause to originate. That's when, we, that's when making comes into place. When God causes what is in his mind to formulate. We're going to, start, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. All right? So as far as God is concerned, the end is already done. All right? Works which he had made and rested the seventh day from all his works which he had made or created to make. God blessed the seventh day, uh, sanctified it because it is he that rested from all his works, mm -hmm, which God created and what made, what he created and made. God creates first, then he makes. Praise the Lord. Now, we can't say that. Praise the Lord. We, own, we can't create. We can make, but we can't cause to originate. Now, there's some people that walk around and talk. Now, I'm, I'm getting off the subject. I really don't want to say that, but I guess I got to say it because there is people who misinterpret the text when he says uh, he speaks those things that be not as though they are. You notice the Bible said he does. Didn't say we do. Can the church say amen? You go out there and speak, be it unto thee and make it happen. Watch what happened. It's not going to happen. Praise the Lord. You can alakazam it. And, 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 and pray, praise the Lord. It don't work like that. So we have to understand this is God. Read. Now let's look at this here. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. What are these? These days are the generations of the heavens and earth. How many are there? Seven of them. God has seven generations, seven days, and they're called the Feast of Jehovah. He hid these seven days in the feast. He hid his plan in creation in these seven feasts. They're called generation. Now, he's referring you back to chapters number one and the first four verses of chapters number two. These are whose generations? God's generations. Now, our generations, I would say it like this. Man's generations, the Bible said man's days, um, maybe three score and ten, if by reason of strength, they be four score. So our generation will be considered 70 years. If by reason of strength, maybe 80. That will be a period of a man's life. Because we have to understand days in your Bible mean different things in different places. A day could be 24 hours. A day could be 12 hours. A day could be a thousand years. A thousand years is one day with the Lord. Isn't that right? A day could be 7,000 years. A day could be 40 years. A day could be the span of a man's life, however long it is. It just depends on where you're at and what time. So when we're talking about God's days, his days are a period of 7,000 years. These are not our days. I wrote, read to you the scripture about, um, I think it was last week, we read about um, the feast, I mean, not the feast, but the Sabbath day, where the Bible said that this is the Lord's Sabbath. That was God's Sabbath, and his Sabbath is 7,000 years long. That hasn't happened yet. Can the church say amen? So when he talks about keep, this, uh, keep the Sabbath holy, he's talking about God keeping it holy. God, we keep it holy by living holy today. Can the church say Amen. So the point I'm saying, we have to understand where we're reading at and what God, is, what God is speaking about. So he says, and these are the generations of heaven and earth. Read. When they were created in the day that the Lord God. Now, the, in the day that the Lord God. I want you to catch this. The 50,000 year week of creation is called the day of the Lord God. This is a collection of all seven days, and we're reading the end. This is the day of the Lord God. Therefore, the day of God is 7,000 years. Now, you will read that when we get into it, when you, when you go and read each day. The evening and the morning was the first day. So the day of God is 7,000 years. The day of the Lord God that we're reading here is when he takes his rest, which is a period of 50,000 years. Praise the Lord. And what did he do? 
he took, he took all of those days and hid them in what? The Feast of Jehovah. I got a chart here by Bishop Risman that he wrote. We're going to pull it up in a little bit. He hid them all in what? Those seven feasts. And he had Israel act it out so that what? You and I would know his days. And that we would know what he planned to do in our day. Can the church say amen? This is the reason why he did it. So you understand what you're reading here? He says, the, in the day that the Lord God, the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Can the church say amen? This is the day of the Lord God, which is, bring that chart back up when, right quick so, so, that, so we can see it. Chart number one, thank you. I want you to see this so you can understand. Can you see the, the bottom part of that? God's creation is a period of 50,000 years, 7,000 years for one day is called a generation. 7,000 years for one day is called one generation. One generation in your Bible is called the day of God. Praise the Lord. Which is one generation. The day of the Lord God equals all seven of God's generation plus one. Because in the 50th year is what is called Jubilee, and that's a type of eternity, which is reverting of all things back to their original state. Can the church say amen? So I wanted to read the scripture so we can see. This that we read right here is the day of the Lord God. This is when he ends his work. In the day that the Lord God, what, made the heavens and the earth. That's not happened as of yet, but it will happen when we enter into eternity. Let me give you a scripture so you can understand that. Let's go over to um, Ephesians chapters number two. I think it's chapters number two. This is what will happen when eternity and God has finished all of his days. Can the church say amen? This is what's going to happen. Ephesians chapters number two, and I think it's verse number seven. Praise the Lord. Yes. Yes. Chapters number two, verse number seven. This speaks of the ages to come. This is eternity. When he takes his rest, after his rest is done, he has his, he has his church in heaven. He has, his, he has his church in heaven, as it were, his bride in heaven. He has his children here on earth. Praise the Lord. Let's look and see what's going to happen. Read verses number seven. What did it say here? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, that's eternity. There is some riches, there is some glory that God wants to reveal in the ages to come. We don't know it as of yet, but this has to do with after, after his creational week is done, the ages to come will take place. Now, what that is, I don't know, but I'm waiting to get there. Can the church say amen? This is really the only scripture, one of the only scriptures that we have that deals with after creation. In the ages to come, who is us? The church. Can the church say amen? All right, let's go to Exodus. Praise the Lord. I would, I would like to get into these days tonight, the first day which will be Passover, which we're going to be in there for a little while. Praise the Lord, because we have to teach it from three specific areas. And let's go to Exodus chapters number 23. I'm still trying to establish these days. Can the church say amen? Exodus 23, verses number 14. So what is, a, what is a generation? A period of time. We're talking about God's generations, not ours. Praise the Lord. I said Exodus chapters number 23, didn't I? All right, that's what I want. You're exactly right. My Bible's getting a little old here, but I'm holding on. Praise the Lord. Let's see here. Verse number 14. This is talking about their feasts, God's days. All right. What did it say here? Three times shall ye keep a feast 
unto me in the year. Now, why did God tell him to do this? It's because he was displaying what he was going to do for the church. Three times. They had to go up. Um, they had to go up three times to accomplish seven feasts. Can the church say amen? The first time they went up, they, they accomplished the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Second time they went up, they accomplished the feast of Pentecost. Third time they went up, they accomplished the feast of, of trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Praise the Lord. I want you to bring up chart number two, if you don't mind, so they can see it. This was the, this was the timeline in which they did this. Chart number, that's, there we go. Now, they would, co they would go up during the month of Abib, which is, the, we'll read it in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. The month of Abib was the start of the Jewish year. Praise the Lord. It was called Abib before they went into exile after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. After they came out, they called it Nisan. But, or Nisan, however you want to pronounce it. But in any case, this is what they did. Now, what did P Passover mean to them? They were celebrating the passing out of Egypt. The passing from the absence of life to the presence of life. Because when they were in Egypt, they were in darkness. Praise the Lord. Egypt was a type of the world. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but Egypt represented the world. So in order for God to take them out of the world, he had to pass them from life, from, from, uh, from death to life. Same thing on the first day of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, earth without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The spirit of God moved upon the waters. This represented the passing of the absence of life to the presence of life. Praise the Lord. That term life, that term a light meant life, excuse me. Did not mean natural daylight. Daylight didn't come to the fourth day of creation. This meant God stepping into the ex vast expanse of nothing, praise the Lord, and life taking place. And this is exactly what he did with Israel. Praise the Lord. He stepped into that which was lifeless and gave them life. And that Passover lamb represented them passing from death to life. Can the church say amen? So that was the first feast. And they did this yearly for 1,500 years to show what God did in creation when he began to make the world or the earth, as it were. Can the church say amen? The second day or the second feast that they did was unleavened bread. Praise the Lord. Which represented to them, they took the bread, the yeast out of their bread for seven days. What were they doing? They were eating the sincere word of light, the sincere bread of, um, of God, as it were. The, this is what they typified. Can the church say amen? Now remember, in the second day of creation, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I shouldn't be talking about this right now, but I'm trying to pace myself. But in any case, this represented saints when the earth was covered in water. What did God do? He divided the waters from the waters. Praise the Lord. And what he brought solid matter out of the water. Just like they took the, the yeast out of, their out of their bread, the corrupting agent. You couldn't live on the earth unless God brought the earth from amongst the waters. Creating an expanse which we call the heavens. For there is waters above us and there's waters beneath us. Now what happened in the days of Noah when the flood came? The, water said, the Bible said he opened up the fountains of the deep and he rained down waters from above. You know why he did that? Because in the second day of creation, for 7,000 years, the earth was covered in water. And he had to divide it. So you have waters above your head, which, we, which is the heavens, the clouds. Then you have waters beneath. Can the church say amen? So they separated. There was a natural shrinkage, and we'll get into that. But I simply wanted to show you. Then... The fourth day of creation, I mean, excuse me, the third day of creation was called unleavened, I mean, excuse me, was called first fruits. What did God do on the fourth day of creation? He brought the herb, praise the Lord, yielding its fruit after its kind, as it were. Isn't that right? This is what he did. Fifth, 
Fourth day was called Pentecost. Sixth day uh, was called Trumpets. Uh, fifth day, excuse me, was called Trumpets. Sixth day was called uh, Atonement. And the seventh day was called um, Tabernacle. So this is, how, this is how it was. And I, don't, I probably better not try to get into that because I'll eat up my whole Bible study because I have to get into each day in particular. But in any case, this is how it was. Now you can see up there, saints, all of them have a significance and reference to us in our day. Can the church say amen? But in any case, this is how it was and what God was doing. So let's go back and let's read here in the, in the um, 14th verse of chapters number 23. Can the church say amen? What did it say? Three times shall I'll keep the feast mm -hmm, uh, uh, unto me in the year. Every year, read, and thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Read, and thou shalt, uh, thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I have commanded thee in the time appointed in the month of Abib. Read. For, it, uh, for in it thou shalt uh, came out from Egypt. In this day, or in this particular time, they came out of Egypt. Remember, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover coincided with one another. They ran together. They ate the Passover lamb and the unleavened bread at the same time. What happened with Jesus? Jesus died on Pentecost. He died on Passover, Right? Laid in the grave during unleavened bread, and rose on what? First fruits. He fulfilled all of these, all of these days, or all of these um, feasts when he was here. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you how they represent to us today. Read. What did it say here? Verse, uh, let's finish verse number um, 15. And none shall appear before me empty. Read verse number 16. And the feast of harvest, first fruits of thy labor, with thou uh, shall sow in the field. Mm -hmm, read. And the feast of uh, gatherings, that's the feast of tabernacles. Read. Which is in the end of the year. That's the last feast. Read. When thou, uh, when thou hast gathered of the field. Now, I want to make this point here. When God gave them these seven feasts, or these seven days, remember, much of the law could not be acted out until they got into the promised land. They had no first fruits because they had no plants to crop. They had no, um, they had no crops to plant. Why? Because they were in the desert. So for at least 40 years, while they wandered around in the wilderness, they could not observe these feasts. But once they got over into the promised land, Moses had first gave them the feast. When they got over into the promised land, then they begin to operate and accomplish these feasts. Praise the Lord. This is the way it was. And so we have to understand that there were certain things that they couldn't do, but yet and still they had to do when they had, a, when they had an opportunity. So let's continue to move on here, saints. Go back to the, that first... Um, I want to go back to that first sheet, and let's look at two verses. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel tonight, chapters number 22. And this is the reason why God knows these days, because Daniel saw him, saints, as the ancient of days. Can the church say amen? He is the beginning. Beginning of days, who he has no days and no end of life. Can the church say amen? Times are in his hands. Daniel chapters number, that's not in your syllabus there, but Daniel's chapters number 7 and verses number 22 is what we, I want to read here. And then I think after this, we have one other scripture, then we're going to deal with Pentecost. Can the church say amen? We're going to get into these days tonight, if the Lord will. Chapters number 7 of Daniel. This is Daniel seeing him as the ancient of days. Because he is the creator, he is the ancient of days. He is the um, creator of time. Can the church say amen? 
Verse number 22. What did it say here? Until the ancient of days come and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Now that time is going to come, but I wanted to read this scripture to help us to understand this particular title of God or Jesus, that he is the ancient of days. So if he's the ancient of days, these times belong to him. He is the creator of all time. Can the church say amen? And without him, there would be no time. And eventually the Bible said that the angel's going to stand on the sea and on the land and say, times shall be no more as when God sees fit. Can the church say amen? Now I'm going to give you one more scripture. Then we're going to examine each day in its setting. Can the church say amen? Let's go to Psalms 31. I want to let you know where our times are at, where your time is at, where my time is at. 31, verse number 14, and I think 14 and 15 is what I want. Let me see here. Yes. Verse number 14 and 15. But I trust in thee, O Lord, I say it, thou art my God. What? My times are in thy hands. Whose times are in his hands? Our times are in his hands. Why? Because he is the author of time. Your time is in his hands. Now, some people think that they're on their own time clock, but that Bible didn't say that. The Bible said that my times are in his hands. Can the church say amen? Why? Because he is the one that authored all time. Read here. Let's finish this verse. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. So we established the fact that our times are in his hands. And I want to go to the, let's see here. We're going to get into the feast of Pentecost. I mean, not Pentecost, but Passover. And we're going to deal with it from three specific areas. Number one. We're going to talk about what God did in creation. Pull up chart number three. Can the church say amen? Pentecost. And I made the statement that Pentecost, Pentecost by definition, deals with the passing from the absence of life to the presence of life. When they acted out the Feast of Pentecost, they were acting out what God did on the first day of creation when there was no life. God's presence stepped into the midst of nothing and created life. Can the church say amen? Let's go to, let's, let's go to the first chapter of Genesis. Chapters number one. We're going to read the first five, five verses. Can the church say amen? Chapters number one, first five verses. This is Pentecost. This is the first 7,000 years of God's Creation, we're going to read here. Can the church say amen? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Read. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Mm -hmm. And God divided the light from darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Remember I made the statement last week that this is the goodness of God. God's 50,000-year plan of creation is what? His goodness. So the first day of creation represented when God stepped into, I'm going to read this to you, drop, I want Go to chart number four if you can. So you can see this is what happened on the first day of creation. I don't know if you, if you can see it as of yet, but I want to read it to you so you can understand what happened. God stepped into the vast expanse of nothing. Chart number four. Can you see that up there? 
You, you guys see it? Go down to, uh, let's see here, the physical formation of the first day. It was God bursting uh, forth of the invisible God into the midst of empty space, which is nothing, grappling with things unseen, whirling them around and around, thus creating an um, unmeasurable luminous mass of gas, of gaseous substance, mingled with vapors, f fumes, gases, finally crystallizing into a molten mass of matter as the seventh, as the 7,000 year age ended. Now this is what happened. Remember, at, in the core of your earth is what? What is in the core of the earth? Lava. This shows you what the earth was at the beginning of creation. It was a molten mass of matter. Praise the Lord. It eventually, it, before that, it was gas. And as God stepped into the expanse of nothing, he began to create. The earth was in that day, it was simply a molten mass of matter. As God stepped into the vast expanse of nothing and created it, praise the Lord, this is what we will call, um, if, you would, if, you, if you would go and examine it, you will find um, that if you uh, look, anybody know what the ether kingdom is? It is the gas. It is what we will call um, the gas kingdom, where if you apply, apply enough heat to anything, it will go back to its original state. You guys understand that? That's science. Now, in the first day of creation, God began to whirl around nothing, thus forming a hot molten mass of, of, of matter covered in water. Can the church say amen? And also what he did on the first day of creation, he separated, he made a distinction between light and darkness. Now, this is not natural light. This is spiritual darkness and spiritual light. Because remember, the first day of creation, saints, was not the formation of natural light. This light here is life. Because at, at, at that point, there was no life. Nothing existed. Into the eternal God moved into that which was nothing and began to create. So if you can think about it in your mind, the earth, the planets out there hissing through the galaxy, this earth covered in water, praise the Lord, there was absolutely nothing. And then God, as it begins to settle from the, from the first to the second day, it solidified. It cooled, but at the core of your earth right now, it's still what is the earth's beginning, which is lava. Can the church say amen? You notice here it said it was what? He moved upon what? The waters. So somehow, be, somehow in this day, the, what God used to cool the earth was what? Water. Can the church say amen? All right, now let's look at this. Let's go back to verse number one. I want to get, pull out a few things in here so you can understand. And I, I was trying to find a way to um, explain this in a way that we can understand. This is what it was in that day. In the beginning, God created. That's caused to origin, that means to originate in his mind, the heavens and the earth. The earth was without, was without form and void. Now this here, um, there is actually, saints, there's about 35,000 years difference between the first and the second verse. Now, I want to say this to you so that you can understand. The, the Bible is not written in such a way that we can understand it. The earth became without form and void when Satan fell out of, as it were, he was cast out of heaven in the fifth day of creation. Now, it's put here intentionally by God so that man cannot pick the Bible up, read it, and get an understanding. You will see that Jeremiah talks about this in Jeremiah. He saw the earth without, that it was without form and void, and he makes re reference to the fall of Satan. So the term form and void here has to do with lost its original shape when Satan was cast out of heaven. But we don't have time to talk about that. We have to deal with that when we get to the fifth day. But in any case, and the spirit of uh, God moved upon the face of the deep, 
and, and God moved upon the face of the water, and God said, let there be light. Now, the Bible said in, I think it was in St. John chapters number one, verses number five. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. This is God creating life. This is God creating life. Now, he was speaking of Jesus, praise the Lord, in that day. Now, this was Jesus as the creator, praise the Lord, bringing life into that which was lifeless. That's what Passover means. It means the absence, moving from the absence of life to the presence of life. Can the church say amen? And how did he do that? He stepped into the advanced expanse of nothing, praise the Lord, and created solid matter in which we stand on today called the earth. Can the church say amen? Read here. Let's keep reading. Verse number, uh, let's, verse number five, four. And he said, and he saw the light that it was good. And he divided the light from the darkness. Then the second part of, of Passover does this. It divides spiritual light from darkness. This is what he did. This is spiritual darkness and spiritual light. Now, if I can give it to you like this. When they acted out the Feast of Passover, what were they doing? They were showing how God brought life into the earth and how he separated them from darkness. Can the church say amen? They did it every year for approximately 1,500 years under the law. And what do we do? When we repent from our sins, what do we do? We die. It also represents death, whether you know it or not. Passover represents death. And the only way you move from spiritual darkness into spiritual light, you have to what? Die. The Bible said we're buried with him by baptism unto death like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We should also raise as it were and walk in the newness of life. I didn't quote it exactly, but that's what it means. So this represented what God did. He passed that which was dead into life. And how did he do it? His spirit moved. Can the church say amen? Some people think that this is talking about something else. No, this is the typology of how we get into church. Seen in, on the first day of creation, praise the Lord, the first step that we take. Can the church say amen? We're talking about creation, right? This is what he did. He created, he burst, the invisible God burst into empty space. Can the church say amen? Now, all of this is happening in his mind. And he's speaking what is in his mind, and what is in his mind is coming to fruition. Can the church say amen? Grappling with things unseen, whirling them around and around, thus creating vapors, gas, heat, hot matter. Can the church say amen? And it formulating into an earth in which we call today. It wasn't a big bang. It was God causing it to exist. Because God makes nothing into something. Can the church say amen? I wondered how I was going to explain it so that we can understand it. This is how it was. The first day of creation represented what? The passing from death to life. Or from the absence of life to the presence of life. There was no life. Time didn't exist into what it passed over. And this is exactly what he did. Now let's go to a verse in your Bible. Can the church say amen? Let's go to Colossians. The invisible God. This is what the invisible God did. Praise the Lord. 1 and 15. Can the church say amen? Remember, God doesn't need anything to make something. Can the church say amen? God does it when there's nothing. We only take, harness the elements that God has put here on earth to make what we have right now. Can the church say amen? This is God harnessing nothing and making something out of it. And that's exactly what he did with us. Praise the Lord. I had nothing to offer God. This is, we're going to look at the invisible God here. Praise the Lord. Verse number one, chapters number one, verse number 15. 
Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now, who is this image? That image was Jesus. The invisible God took upon the image. So in the, from the first day of creation, the invisible God stepped into nothing and caused to formulate time, gave us a pattern on the first day of creation, and gave us an example, as it were, with the first feast of Jehovah, what he did for 7,000 years. Praise the Lord. Causing matter to take place, to formulate. Praise the Lord. And also what he did is on this first day, saints, he created an atmosphere with, praise the Lord, for us to exist in. Now, you will notice how God's plan is always orderly. God didn't bring, saints, the herb-yielding fruit on the first day before he made an earth to put it on. Can the church say amen? God's plan is orderly. And this also shows us the operation of God within the church. Everything that God does is orderly. Praise the Lord. It has a set time. Can the church say amen? So the first thing that he did, he put, praise the Lord, the earth in orbit. It was a hot molten mass of solid matter. Praise the Lord, with no human life form. There are no little green man on Mars. This is the only place that has an atmosphere to sustain any life. Can the church say amen? He covered the earth in water, causing it to cool. Now take us into the second day where the earth solidified and it shrunk. Praise the Lord. And there was an expanse that was made, an expanse above us, which is called the heavens. And then there was earth below us, waters above us, water be waters below us. So this symbolized two things. And I'm going to keep reiterating this as I go. What? The passing from absence of life or light to the presence of life and the dividing between light and darkness. Can the church say amen? Spiritual darkness... Spiritual light. That's what Passover means. And what does it mean to us? And we'll get into some scriptures as we go on because I got three charts to deal with this. When we talk about the church, it means to us when we repent and die out to the world. We pass, we begin to pass from the absence of life to the what? Presence of life. Because you can't live unless you die out like Jesus did. Now, he didn't have sin, but he died on the cross and he was our Passover, the Bible said. Can the church say amen? So who is this image of the invisible God? Jesus is. Can the church say amen? So, and I'm going to give you this also while we're here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible said that Jesus was the beginning of the creation of God. Before God made anything, he created in his mind, formulated cause to exist these seven days, and hid in these seven days, these seven feasts of Jehovah, what he planned to do with you and with me. Praise the Lord. He created Jesus because he knew that Jesus would be the one that would come, praise the Lord, to fulfill all seven of these in the church. Again, the church say amen. You see how, God planned, how God's plan works? Praise the Lord. He knows the end from the beginning. That's the reason why I read you this scripture. Can the church say amen? Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. We didn't see the image till he came. But that image, that invisible God, was not in the image form then. He was in spirit. And he stepped in and made something out of nothing. Go to St. John chapters number uh, one. Can the church say hallelujah? It's not on this sheet here. We're talking about Seven Feast of Jehovah, which is a study of time. And the earth crystallized, thank you, Holy Ghost, at the end of the 7,000 years, praise the Lord. And yet in the middle of this earth is the beginning of its creation. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. And every now and then you have a volcano and God shows you how he started it. And, what, and I'll give you this also as we move on. What is going to be the place in which God puts man that rejects his word? In the lake of fire. You know what's in the lake of fire? 
this hot matter. Hot molten mass of matter is sitting right in the middle of the earth. Just how God started it. Can the church say amen? Praise the Lord. This is how he did it. These are whose days? God's days. And they acted it out to show what he did on his first day. Where he passed from the absence of life to the presence of life. Let's go to St. John chapter number one. Let's look at this here. Who, what, who did this? We're going to see who did this. Who started life, time, who began it. Can the church say amen? If, I'm, if, 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 if you don't understand what I'm saying, raise your hand. I'll, I'll answer it. I don't want anybody to get lost tonight in what I'm trying to say. Can the church say amen? There was no big bang. It was, an, it was creational evolution through a process of time. It did, wasn't no explosion and, and all of a sudden this all happened. No. We're going to read a scripture to show you that in a minute. All right, verses number one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. In the beginning was the thinker Praise the Lord. And the thinker thought a thought. Praise the Lord. And the thinker calls his thoughts that was in his mind to begin to materialize. And who was that thinker? It was God, the Elohim. What's his name? Jesus. Can the church say amen? He was invisible in that day. He became visible in our day. Can the church say amen? And he caused this hot, luminous mass of matter to begin to form. And what do we see right now? The earth that we stand on. Can the church say amen? Now I'm going to show you some also as we get into uh, the furtherance of these days. It was called the earth in that day. We'll see what it's called in the sixth day. All right, verse number two. What did it say here? The same was in the beginning with God. What? His thoughts. His word, his plan. When you read the seven feasts of Jehovah, what are you reading? You're reading God's plan, his blueprint. I made this statement, the first 34 verses of your Bible is God's plan, what he planned to do. And because we are his children, his day saints are not hid from us. Why? Because he has revealed them unto us. I think I read last week, Deuteronomy chapters number 29 and 29. The secret things belongeth to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belongeth unto us. This is revealed to us. Can the church say amen? All right here, verse number three. All things were made by him. Everything, read, was made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Or... The absence of him, there was nothing that existed. We're talking about the beginning of all creation. Nothing existed without the absence of him. Or before the first day, there was nothing. After the seventh day, there'll be eternity. Time starts and stops. Eternity is endless. Before the first day of creation, it was eternity. After creation, there is eternity. In the middle, there's 50,000 years. And in these feasts are hid what God was going to do. Amen. Now, we're just dealing with the creation part. We'll deal with the example in the next chart. Can the church say amen? So all of this was done to show what? What he wanted to do for you. He didn't do it for them. He did it for us. Can the church say amen? All right. Made, verses number four. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Now this light, or life, was what the first day of creation was talking about. In him was life. In the one that spoke, let there be life or light, or let there be light, there was life. So when he said, let there be light, he was saying, let there be life. And what happened? Life began to form. 
matter begin to take place, the atmosphere begin to shape. You hear what I'm saying tonight? This is how it was. Right? It wasn't how Darwin said it was. It, this is how the Bible said it was. And how long did it take for the, for the first day to formulate? 7,000 years. Or at the end of 7,000 years, the earth had been created. It had been made. That was the first day. Was there human life on it? No. But life had begun to take place because God said, let there be light. Praise the Lord. All right here. Verse, let's finish verse number. Uh, yeah. Life was the light of man. Or let's finish this here. And that life was the light of man or the pattern of man. This is the reason why this is important. Because in these seven feasts, we see the pattern of life. How life took place in the beginning and how life is going to take place in us. Can the church say amen? And the first way that it takes place is that God has to step into that which is dead or which has no life. And then life has to take place. Just like he stepped into our life. And what happened? Life took place. And I'll give this also to you, that the only way for life to take place, death has to be present. Why, does, why do I say that? I say that because of this. We see it in the natural sense. Life comes out of death. When you put a seed into the ground, what does it do? It dies. It germinates. And what happens? Life takes place. And I'll show you in the scriptures when we get to the fulfillment of the Passover in us. Jesus said, except a, ground, a kernel of wheat fall to the earth and die, it cannot bring forth. What he was talking about was his death. He was talking about the death that he would die and be our Passover from death to life. Can the church say amen? So there had to be nothing or there had to be death or the absence of life in order for life to take place. Because something had to bring it to life. Praise the Lord. So what God, what was in God's mind, saints, he began to cause to, what was in his mind, he caused to exist, what he caused to exist in his mind, excuse me, he made come to life when he himself spoke it. And it started to happen. Can the church say amen? This is how it was. You didn't, you didn't evolve from no monkey or no ape. Praise the Lord. If that was the case, if man evolved from some inanimate or some, um, not an animate, but some, even an inanimate, inanimate object that has no life, or man evolved from some uh, single cell organism, then men would be yet evolving today. Because your Bible said that whatever God made, the seed was in itself. God made a complete being with the ability to bring forth within itself. See, God didn't make something that evolved through time. When you see those plant life and when you see all that stuff existed when God made it. Hello? It didn't evolve. God made it what it was, and Adam named it just like God allowed him to. And it also shows that man, saints, has intelligence. Isn't that right? I'll give you this, and I'm jumping ahead of myself. Man is the most intelligent being that God has ever created. Because there's nothing else in the creation of God that has been able to, how can I say it, been able to catapult over man. I don't care how many times scientists take these monkeys and lock them up in a cage and try to teach them how to talk. They will never be smarter than man. <laughs> because man, God gave man what? Dominion. Somebody say he's talking good tonight. But it all started what? On Passover. In the creation of God, when God allowed what was in his mind to begin to uh, 
be made through him stepping into that which was nothing. All right? Now he's also going to show you here the separation between light and darkness. This is spiritual. This is not natural. Can the church say amen? Because I've already said there was no natural, this is not natural light. Can the church say hallelujah? This is spiritual. Read. And the light shine in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So in that day, he separated darkness from light because the darkness cannot comprehend light. The Bible called you and I the children of what? The day or the children of light. How do we get it? We pass out of death into life. Can the church say amen? We are no longer, and how do we, we are no longer what we used to be. Can the church say amen? This is how it was. So he had to give us a likeness. He had to give us a pattern for us to understand what he was going to do when we came along. Then he gave Israel the feast for them to do for 1,500 years to give us an example. Because God is smart enough to know that we can't do it by ourselves. So he gives us example after example. He gives us the plan. We're reading the plan here. Then he gives us, saints, the typology of that plan or a physical, um, how can I say, tangible example to look at because we were not there when he created. So he says, you weren't there when I created. I'm going to show Moses what I created. I'm going to give it to Moses. I'm going to give it to my children, Israel. They're not going to know what they're doing so I can show you what I did and how I'm going to pass you from where they were in typology to where I wanted you to go. Isn't God wonderful? He is powerful, isn't it? Can the church say amen? Let me bring this out also as we begin to close this Bible study. I didn't get as far as I wanted to tonight. Let's go back to that. Let's go back to this um, Genesis. Can the church say amen? Any good tonight? Praise the Lord. And I want to read verses number two here. Chapter number one, verses number two. What did it say here? And the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's a scripture in your Bible that says dead things are formed from under the water. Now, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I want to give you this in the last maybe 10 minutes of this particular Bible study to show you. I'm going to cover this when I deal with the fulfillment in the church in, the, in a couple of charts over or so. But what, di- what God did is showed us here in typology, in creation, of how he passes us from death to life. When the Bible talked about the dead things are formed from beneath the waters, God brings forth life out of the waters. And when we were in sin, we heard the gospel preached, praise the Lord, we believed the gospel, we repented, transitioning us, praise the Lord, the start of life, we were coming out of death into life. We died. The Bible said we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, we also should rise to walk in the newness of life. So when he talks about the spirit of God moved upon the waters, when the preacher calls out the name of baptism in Jesus' name over your grave, you rise, I rose to walk in the newness of life. This is what this is referring to. This is typology of how the earth in that day was baptized in water. And what did God do? He brought forth the earth out of the waters, showing us what we do to transition from death to life. 
You could preach Jesus from cover to cover. Can the church say amen? The Bible said, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. I think it was Bishop Brisbane said he was trying to find a, 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 a sermon to preach, and everywhere he opened his Bible, he saw Jesus. You know why? Because he is in every book of the Bible. The first day of creation, you see Jesus. You see Jesus making, making something out of nothing. And the same thing happened with us. We were nobody. Praise the Lord. We heard the gospel preach. We died. We were in death. We heard it. We believed it. And we passed from death to life. That's Passover. And this is what the significance to us. Now, I've jumped way ahead of myself, and I ain't got, gave you all the scriptures yet. But I'm going to give it to you as we go, go along. Can the church say amen? Any good tonight? Let's go to, let's see why he can do this. Let's go to Romans, chapters number four. Any good? Earth was covered in water, or the earth was baptized. That's why you got to get baptized. Can the church say amen? This is all in the Feast of Jehovah. These seven feasts. Whose days are they? God, these are not our days. These are God's days. Our days are 24 hours a, a day. That's how we number time. We got that in the fourth day of creation. When he puts times and seasons, this before he put us down here. 17. 4 and 17. Can the church say amen? Yes. This is scripture I alluded to. Read. As it is written... I have made thee a father of many nations. Now that's speaking of Abraham, of course. Read. Before whom he believed, even God, who quickened his, the, uh, the dead, and this is the part I wanted, and calleth those things which be not as though they are. So when we read in our Bible, it is God calling the things which be not as though they are. We understand it now, but he called it before it was. Can the church say amen? Before there was, he said it would be, and it was. Can the church say amen? Now, I quoted, I, I, I quoted the scripture earlier, but I'm re reading now to show us. Who said this? God, who calleth those things that be not as though they are. There was a woman walking around talking about, I speak it, and, I, and I'm going to call things that be not as though they are. Praise the Lord. Now, what scripture is that? She was referring to this one, but that's not what it said. Can the church say amen? God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things that be not as though they are. I want to show you also something in here. We may read it next week. God is going, because God is faithful, God told Abraham that he would give him a thousand generations in your Bible. And those thousand generations will be accomplished at the end of time. He will have a earthly seed. He will have a heavenly seed that will equal a thousand generations. That's in the book of Psalms. We don't have time to read it. But in any case, he's speaking about Abraham. God calls those things that be not, and yet God is faithful. Before anything happened, who, what, where, when, he did it. Let's go. Let's drop down. Let's go back to chart number uh, four here. Can the church say amen? I'm, am I making sense tonight? Praise the Lord. Let me look at this chart number four. We read point number one. Let's read point number two. The earth was covered in water. Mm -hmm. This is what was. This is what the earth was at the end of the first day of creation. Two opposite forms of matter, earth, hot matter, water, liquid matter, combined in one space with no separation. At the end of the first day of creation, as we enter into the second day, this was the state of the earth. Can the church say amen? Two atmospheres together. Praise the Lord. Could life take place? Could natural life take place on the earth at this point? 
No, it couldn't. Yet in this, in this ball, in this particular place, is our atmosphere. H2O, oxygen, was created. Can the church say amen? The water served two things. It cooled the earth, praise the Lord, and it created the heavens. As it cooled, there was an expanse, a natural shrinkage. It's like when you take this glass of water, and let's say, it's, let's say in this particular um, sanctuary, it is 150 degrees. You take this glass of water, you put a lid on it, you put ice in it. You take it out of the, out of the uh, refrigerator, you bring it in here, what's going to happen? It's going to, right, but there will be what, there's what we call, this is, there's what is called a natural shrinkage. And if you seal it, it'll pop this glass open. Praise the Lord. So as the earth cooled on the first day of creation, going into the second, there was a shrinkage. And the earth divided the waters from the waters. Does that make sense? That's the natural law. That's not my law. That's God's law. Praise the Lord. I'll give you another example as I close. When I worked um, construction, we used to put conduit together out in the parking garage. We would not use metal conduit. We, we would use what is called PVC. And every 100 feet or so, you would have to put what, what is called an expansion coupling. Somebody say, well, why would you do that? This glued all together is fine. Because as the two atmospheric pressures came together, summertime, and wintertime, it expand and it, it, it would expand and it would contract. This is the natural law of science that God created as he went from one day to the next. And within this fear, he gave us what we needed to live. This is where, uh, as it were, um, the ability for us to breathe took place. Can the church say amen when he separated? Anybody had any questions tonight? I didn't get as far as I want to. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we will get you a... No, I got, I got a bunch of them here, but uh, I'll make some out, and we'll make, I'll make sure I, I get them to you. I may have an extra one upstairs, but we'll make sure we get some copies. But in any case... Um, this is how it was. We're going to try to get through the rest of this and deal with the second part, which would be type, uh, the typology and example seen in the actual feast.